I'm Mark Elliott Lugo, curator for the San Diego Public Library. Welcome to Profiles. Our guest today is San Diego artist William Gambini. Eighty-five-year-old William Gambini first received major recognition as a member of the New York School of Painting in the 1950s when he was actively involved in organizing the 10th Street Cooperative Gallery movement. As abstract expressionism developed and matured, Gambini's circle of friends included some of the most important cultural figures of the 20th century. In the Art News Annual of 1959, Gambini was recognized by Harold Rosenberg, the influential writer and critic, as one of the most promising young painters who would become an inheritor of abstract expressionism. In 1975, Gambini received a Mark Rothko Foundation grant and moved to San Diego. And in 1999, at age 81, he received a prestigious Pollock Krasner Foundation grant award. To this day, he maintains a rigorous schedule of painting and sculpting in his North Park studio. I sat down with Gambini in the Earl and Bertie Taylor Library to discuss his life and art. You've led such a rich and full life, I hardly know where to begin, but I want to give our viewers a frame of reference. Uh, um, you were friends with some of the greatest artists and writers of the 20th century, uh, Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein, Mark Rothko, Hans Hoffman, Archiel Gorky, Adolf Gottlieb, the critics Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, and even Ernest Hemingway. Um, can you give us a sense of what it was like being an artist in New York City during one of the most important uh, periods in the history of art? Well, the best thing I can say is that it was hectic, chaotic, confusing, and every day there was something new. I just happened to be lucky to have a brush, and having a brush, I could paint. When did you come on the scene uh, as, as an artist? Uh, in that period? Well, when I crossed the Brooklyn Bridge, I was about 16 years old, and uh, that was about 19, 1936 or 37. So I left Brooklyn to find a new environment, new world, which was Greenwich Village, and that gave me of inspiration and much to talk about different thoughts and ideas and it was really very important for me at the age of 16 to come to Greenwich Village and to find completely a different atmosphere than Brooklyn and uh, there I met Gorky and de Kooning and a bunch of other older artists. And uh, that's really when I realized that I wanted to paint and do nothing else with my life. Was there any particular artist or professor who was especially influential on your philosophy or your art? Oh yes, Horace M. Callan, professor at the New School for Social Research in uh, Manhattan. And he's the one that really put me on track of history and art in the most concentrated 
and defining and with definitions of history and philosophy of art. The critics back then, such as Harold Rosenberg and Clement Greenberg, were so powerful back then. Uh, did they ever look at your work or comment on it? Or? Well, of course, they would always be uh, quite aware of what was going on. And of course, without the writers and critics, uh, we couldn't have the abstract expressionist movement be extended beyond the studios of the painters. It takes writers and critics and people like Harold Rosenberg, Elaine de Kooning, uh, Hilton Kramer, Clement Greenberg, they were all part of, you might say, the abstract expressionist movement. And it takes the writer to advertise, to promote, and to get it to the public. The artist can't do it by himself. He has pictures, but that's about it. So which galleries uh, exhibited your work, or how did you go about getting your work before the public eye? Well, to tell you the truth, we weren't really concerned about getting the work before the public. Uh, however, it was the uh, cooperative movement on 10th Street that really received the public in a, a, an exciting, moment at that particular time to the extent that the police department had a block off streets on 10th Street and 3rd Avenue so that the people could walk on the street without the traffic. So it was, I would say, the most exciting time. The cooperative galleries, which was run and organized by the artists, and then also receiving the public, as well as having people like Franz Klein, de Kooning, uh, Rothko, support the 10th Street Cooperative Movement. It was quite a time, and it really brought out the essence of what was going on with the abstract expressionism to the public. So it was more than Madison Avenue. The galleries on Madison Avenue, yes, and I showed numerous galleries on Madison Avenue, but what was more important was the 10th Street Cooperative Movement. I know it's very important when the uh most powerful and best known artists support the younger generation of artists. So did they actually go into galleries and, and or buy from the younger artists oh, for yes. their own collections? Well, Hans Hoffman started a collection and he bought uh, numerous paintings from younger artists and almost was gonna buy one of mine, <laughs> but somehow was off track. But I would see Mrs. Hoffman and Hans Hoffman in Washington Square Park, and we had a circle, which was Waverly and McDougal, that writers and composers and poets and dancers and actors, and everybody would meet there. And Hans Hoffman and Mrs. Hoffman would come in, and of course I would sit with them and talk. And it was almost like being in his class, without any question, talking about his push and pull, push and pull, the opposing force. So it was quite a, uh, quite a treat. You mentioned CCNY as being one of the places where you studied art. Where, where else did you study art? Oh, I studied at Columbia. 
NYU, and then several other schools like the Jefferson School, which was a, a communist school. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, the New School, did you ever go to the New School? Uh, uh, the New School for Social Research, right. uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. And uh, there I was going for my graduate and uh, then realized that if I did get the master's degree, that would stimulate me to teach in school. And I decided to drop out and not have the temptation of getting paid every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the struggling artist, it uh, bears fruit in its own way, I guess. Yeah, I was frightened by that. Yeah, the fact yeah. that I could teach, mm -hmm. have a salary, and then not do much painting, but do more teaching. So I dropped out. So how do you start a work of art, a painting or a sculpture? Do you make a preliminary sketch, or do you have a preconceived notion, or what exactly happens? What's the process? Well. In the abstract expressionism, and this is around 46, 47, 48, 49, if you prepared for a painting, a preliminary sketch, or any pre preparation, that was a big sin. And what was the big sin? That it would be contrived before you began a painting. So, no contriving, just walk in completely in the nude, and the nude is not naked, and begin to paint. And that's how we would do it. Direct, nothing of a vision, nothing of an inspiration, nothing of anything. As a matter of fact, you might say it had to do with the mystique, the ambiguous drama of this and that, and nothing completely recognized or subjectivity, nothing, and that was it. So you would, uh, you never knew what you would end up with, basically, it could be either a masterpiece or, or a disaster, right? Depending on the day, or, or were they always great? Uh, yeah. yeah, it had to do not with the masterpiece, uh -huh. <laughs> because we realized that the masterpieces were a museum and what it really had to do was the feeling and the expression without any gimmicks coming along with that possibility of painting. So painting really was completely, from the very beginning, completely its own and you were part of it, and you live with it, and the painting will tell you what to do, and almost all the time, how to do it, what to do, and how to do it. It was that kind of a attitude, and that's what took place. We haven't said anything about scale yet, but I know a painting on a large scale was very important to the abstract expressionists. And you have some fairly large paintings in the show here. Is that a holdover from your abstract expressionist uh, bent? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in other words, uh, that was the whole attitude about abstract expressionists, is that the large paintings, essentially, took away from subjectivity. 
subjectivity such as a small painting, which is a landscape, a seascape, or some figures. So by doing a large painting, you're destroying the subjectivity. You're also questioning any of the little paintings that are just objects over the couch, you might say, the green couch with a red small painting mm -hmm. and a beautiful frame around it. So the large billboard paintings really was rebelling against anything that had to do with subjectivity and anything that had to do as an object in space. Your three-dimensional work is very powerful. I see uh, wall-mounted works. I see kind of sculptures in the round. But I know you make a distinction between sculptures and what you call constructions, and you're really adamant about that. Can you uh, tell us about constructions? And Of course. <laughs> the difference between sculpture and construction is namely that in sculpture, either you're placing clay upon clay to build the particular sculpture. And so you're overlapping and building and building. But the attitude there is on a three-dimensional scale. Whereas in construction, the attitude is in two dimensions. So that the subjectivity is dropped out. What exists is something visual that may be going in many directions, but continually you are going through the particular work so that nothing almost would stop you. And also there's no urgency about having to go around the work of the construction. In other words, you can have one view, you can step aside, have another view, and that would be enough. So the, the, the thing about construction is simply to try to keep it in a two-dimensionality rather than three dimensions. So that one dimension is left out, even though the object is three-dimensional, essentially. Uh, one of the most noticeable attributes about your work is your use of the color orange. And uh, uh, visitors to the gallery here are writing a lot of comments about your work. And one of the most prevalent is, uh, boy, there sure is a lot of orange or red orange in this show, what attracts you to the color, the, to this red-orange color? Is it a custom-made color for you? And why not blue or yellow or green? Or well, <laughs> the thing is that uh, it just happened that when I applied the uh, orange-red color, it seemed to work. And so I just continued applying it. Uh, the thing about the uh, orange-red color, to me, is that it comes close to the English hunter's red. And hunter's red is really symbolically the, uh, the fox hunt, using the fox, uh, using the dogs to follow and trail the fox. And that's always been exciting color for me. It seems to have a 
continual movement in space and uh, some gravity and some suspension, but mostly it has an action or a movement. Other than that, I don't know. <laughs> um, a lot of your works are named after people. Uh, some of the names I recognize, like Franz Klein, for example, but then, and then you just told me about Horace M. Callan, who I didn't know, I didn't know who he was. Uh, how do you come to associate a name with a work? Is it a, tri is it a tribute to them, or how does that work? Well, that's a good question. I uh, believe it's a tribute to the individual and the experience I had with the individual. And it seems to uh, fulfill, uh, you might say, one word, a continuum of the person that I have known. It sort of gives me an everlasting, permanent feeling, whether it's Hans Hoffmann or Franz, part of the experience somehow continuing to be alive. And maybe it's a farewell. No, but still, it's something of a memory. In the library exhibition, we focused on your constructions and your abstractions, your paintings. Um, but there's a whole other body of work in your studio, which is uh, figurative. It's kind of whimsical. It's fun. Uh, can you explain how that other body of work came to be? Is it something you started a long time ago and, uh, and you take up periodically? Uh, it's a very interesting body of work. So. Yes, uh, it's something that is uh, what I believe to be part of art, whether you're doing the figure, whether you're doing the abstractions, whether you're doing anything but has to do with drawing and painting, it's odd. So maybe I'm schizophrenia, that I'm doing <laughs> one week the figure and the uh, next week abstraction. Uh, I still believe it's all part of what I do. And to question it is very difficult. I, I don't have any answers. I just go ahead and I do it. But I've had, I've had questions before in my mind, but then realize they were too deep to try to answer. So I have dismissed any of those questions. Um, do you have a, a special story or a particularly good uh, reminiscence about an artist you know, that uh, we think we might enjoy? Well, uh, I don't know if it's a special story, but uh, one night at the Cedar Bar, which was a, a hangout for the abstract expressionist, Jackson Pollock usually had the corner of the bar. As you walk in, there would be Pollock in the corner. It so happened that we were talking about Miro, uh, Cezanne, and a whole bunch of artists, including Picasso. And it was kind of loud. Well, when someone mentioned Picasso, Jackson Pollock raised up and shouted, I can paint better than Picasso. And there was silence in the bar for at least two, three minutes. And that was the story. Pollock believed that he could paint better than Picasso. Uh, at age 85, you're certainly an inspiration to a lot of us. Um, 
you seem to be as energetic and productive as ever. What is a typical day like for you uh, in your studio? That's uh, so abstract. I wouldn't know what to say. The best thing I could say is, I'm just lucky to be alive. But how do I explain it? I think somebody up there knows it better than me. So the best thing I can say is that I go to the studio and I paint, or sometimes I go to the studio and read, or sometimes you go to the studio and just sit and do nothing. Maybe have a cigarette or two. But I wouldn't know how to answer that. It's too deep for me. For more information about this exhibit or the San Diego Public Library's visual arts program, please call 619-238-6627.